I hear the Lord saying, I will come in the deep recesses of your heart. If you, as you make a way for me, I will come, says the Lord. For it has been my design from the very beginning for my spirit to flow into you, for my spirit to bring life to you, for my spirit to make your life a joyous experience. But yes, the enemy has polluted, has polluted the ground even where the seeds that I've sown has been, has been planted. But know this, I am able to, to vanquish those things that the enemy has tried to hold, us, hold you back. For you see, the things of the Spirit go deep. The things of the Spirit cannot be discerned in this natural realm, nor can your natural mind discern them. But your spirit within, your spirit within that is infused with the life of my spirit is able to make the connection that you need. So as you worship me, as you give me praise, as you acknowledge my presence, I will be there. And here a little, there a little, you will grow deeper in the things of the spirit. But pay attention. Don't let these times, these all awesome times, go by without being sensitive to my spirit, says the Lord. For as I send my spirit amongst you, I send him in order to be honored so that he might be able to accomplish all that I send him to do, says the Lord. For Jesus Christ is Lord, and proclaiming him in every opportunity that you get will give you an open door in order to be influenced by my spirit. So indeed, this life here on earth will be glorious, says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. God, thank you for giving us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Well, after resigning his, his pastor to, to go to another church, a pastor was approached by an endearing older member of the congregation. She wept over the pastor's decision to leave and said, things will never be the same. The minister tried to console her by saying, don't worry, I'm confident you will get a new pastor who is better than me. She continued to sob and replied, that's what the last three pastors said, but they just keep getting worse. <laughs> well, last week I spoke about, uh, really about closing doors about shutting doors that the enemy might have found a way into our lives. Uh, today I want to uh, talk about opening doors. And uh, one of the if you haven't, if you didn't hear last week's message, I really encourage you to go and uh, on our website and listen to it uh, because I believe it'll help set the stage for some of the things I'm sharing today. Uh, but uh, also you need to hear some of the things that uh, were said last week because uh, if there's a door opening in your life that the enemy has an opportunity to take advantage of, that you want to you close that door. And uh, I, I believe that it will uh, impact you. Uh, the pastor friend of ours who told me that she listened to it twice, listened to that message twice, and also uh, encouraged her congregation to listen to it. So there was some meat there. And so I encourage you to go and uh, listen to that. Uh, but I want to talk about opening doors. Because once you close the door, you want to make sure that you also open a door for uh, the presence of God to come to, so that you might be able to receive from him. You'll remember Jesus said that when a spirit goes out of an individual, it goes out and looking, uh, goes out in the dry places looking for another place to, to uh, come in and, and be housed and so it can't find any. So it goes back to the one that it was driven out and it finds out that the person there is... Uh, everything is swept clean so they go on in and they take in a whole bunch more so that the last the last situation is worse than the first and we don't want that to happen so when we, when we get rid of uh, demonic forces in our lives and uh, we always want to make sure that we fill ourselves up with the holy spirit 
so that there's no room for the enemy. If we're so full of the Holy Spirit, spirit, soul, and body, then there's no room for the enemy to, to get in. And so we want to make sure that those doors are shut so that uh, God has complete control. Now, there, one of the reasons why it is so crucial that we do that, uh, well, it's not crucial if we do that if we don't care. If we don't care about having a relationship with God, if we don't care about getting God's best, then maybe it's not that important. But I'll tell you one thing. If you want God's best, there, we must do everything we can to get a disconnected from anything that, any hole that the enemy might have upon our lives. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, the God of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, absolutely nothing in him that he could attach, that the enemy could get attached to. In other words, there was no open door that Jesus gave the enemy an opportunity to come into and get attached to and try to manipulate him. And Jesus wants us to live that way as well. He wants to make sure that we have no open door whatsoever. We close all doors to the enemy. Now, uh, you're, I expect you're like myself, most of us. You know, we're, none of us are all that much different. But throughout our lives, we've no doubt opened the door to the enemy to uh, come, for the enemy to come in sometime and get, uh, get a hold of us in some way so that he can say, I have authority in this realm because I, the door was open to me and so I can come in now and, uh, and manipulate. And one of the biggest ones, one of the biggest doors that people open and the enemy gets attached to is a door of unforgiveness or a door of offense. Uh, in the church, that's one of the, one of the real big ones. And uh, we think sometimes that we might be offended with somebody. And, you know, it's not a really big offense. And we don't see them that much anyway, so we don't really care. So uh, it's, it's not a big deal. Well, it may not be a big deal in the natural, but it's a big deal in the spirit. Because as long as that attachment, as long as that door is open, the enemy can attach some way, somehow, and manipulate you into doing things that you don't want to do. It'll actually be a, a barrier between you and our heavenly father and so we want to make sure we cut all all that off and then open doors to the uh, to the lord so that he can do all that he wants to do in our lives so i'm going to mention a few things here this morning that we can do in order to open the doors positive doors that we want things that we can do in order to allow holy spirit to come in and the first one we're going to mention is in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 2. And the reason why first, that's the first one we're going to mention is because it says it's the first commandment with a promise that there's a blessing there. And it says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment. Everybody say first commandment. It's the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. So that's one way that we open the door to the blessing of God is that we make sure that we honor our parents and that we sometimes we have to start by just start stop dishonoring them in other words stop saying how they were they didn't do such a good job in raising me or they didn't uh, provide for me the way they should have or they didn't teach me the things that they should have they didn't love me the way they abandoned me all that kind of we got to stop saying that and as we stop saying that then we begin to say the lord will give us some things that we can uh, see that our family actually uh, were good at some things that they did do very good as long as we see the negative it'll blind our eyes to the good uh, many years i was brought up in in a, a large family and it was a, a an acadian french acadian catholic family and when i was very very young it was uh, it was a shameful thing in, in, at least in my area it was a shameful thing to be uh, acadian or french because it seemed like there was a lot of poverty around at uh, that particular time. And I remember uh, somebody saying something about uh, French Acadians and, uh, to my mom when I was just a little individual and uh, saying something about uh, my mom being embarrassed to speak Acadian French. There was actually a, a, a Quebecois person who was there and he was trying to get my mom to talk in French and she could talk in French, but it was Acadian French and of course, uh, the Quebecers, at least at that time, they made fun of if you didn't talk, it wasn't pure French, if it wasn't Quebec French. And anyway, 
Uh, I remember standing by my mom one time and this person trying to get her to talk French and, and it just seemed, and she wouldn't, and he was c trying to heap shame on her and it seemed like I just took that. It seemed like I just took that shame on me, shame of my heritage, shame of my culture. And for years after that, for years, I tried to do everything I can to kind of uh, distance myself from my Acadian background. I, I, for many, many, many years, that, that took place. In fact, to, to the degree that I would go to school and make fun of, fun of the French Acadians, and me being one of them, uh, they make fun of the way they talked and so forth. And uh, many years later, a, a man said to me, uh, actually, uh, he asked me about my French Acadian background. And I said, well, I'm French Acadian, I'm Canadian, period. What's got French Canadian? And he, he pushed me into that in uh, looking at my culture, looking at my background. And the, make a long story short, the Holy Spirit kind of moved upon me through that season and uh, got, caused me to be able to look at my background and uh, I remember Holy Spirit somehow moving upon me in a way to start to allow me to see the good parts of my Acadian background. And one of the good parts of the Acadian background, of course, there was, there was always a lot of uh, family around. There was always somebody, you know, when, when the families would get together, there'd be somebody with a uh, guitar or a fiddle or something, there'd be dancing going on and be all kinds of laughing and and a lot of kids running around, and there'd be all kinds of fun times. And I remember at one time, it just seemed like the Holy Spirit revealed all that to me and brought my, to my memory all those good times. And I remember, uh, you know, I just felt moved upon by, my, by the Spirit of God to say, I, I want that back. I, I want that back. I want that thing that I lost. I want it back. And I, but I couldn't see it until I let go of looking at just the negative. I couldn't see it uh, because all, before I would always only look at the negative. Even after I got saved, even after I got saved, I, I related to even the, the, the drinking that, I, that uh, I'd been involved in and so forth and, and the drinking and to some degree that I was brought up with. It was part of partying all the time. I even re related that to my culture, even after I was saved. So, uh, you know, push that further and further away. But when the Lord began to show me the good parts of it, uh, there was a, I took a different attitude, different attitude about that altogether. But if we don't stop looking at the negative, we'll never see the good. Honor your father and your mother. Stop looking at the negative things that your mom and dad did or didn't do. And God will begin to show you some things that are very positive, some things that you can rejoice about. I was sharing that one time, in, uh, quite a number of years ago, and I was a large meeting. There was a lot of internationals there, and and a lady came up to me after, and she said, when you were sharing about that, she said, the Holy Spirit just got all over me about my German heritage. She said, I was so ashamed of my German heritage uh, because of what happened during World War II. I was so ashamed of that. And the Lord uh, spoke to me and told me that I needed to have a different attitude and began to allow him to be able to see what my heritage can bring to me. So honor your mom and dad. Stop looking at the negative and God will show you the good. That's one door we can open. Honor your father and your mother. Another door, uh, <clears throat> a door of praise, a door of worship. That's why we come uh, every Sunday morning, we come to worship God, we come to give him thanks. It is a, a time of thanksgiving and praise, a time of, of lifting up our, our hands in worship, a time of just uh, giving him glory. So uh, in Psalm 28, verse 1, it says, psalmist david wrote this to you i will cry O lord my rock do not be silent to me lest you are silent lest if you are silent to me i will become like those who go down to the pit hear the voice of my supplication when i cry to you when i lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary when i lift up my hands between before your holy sanctuary and this is a time of, of praise in psalm 134 verse 2 uh, Myra, can you put the scripture verses up there in, instead of the uh, video, uh, the uh, PowerPoint right now? <clears throat> in uh, Psalm 134, verse 2, it says, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Again, the lifting up hands signifying praise and worship. In Psalm 63, 4, 
Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And in Psalms 141, 2, it says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. You see, we come before the Lord to worship God. We come before the Lord to give him praise, to have fellowship with him, because the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we come before him uh, in worship, he takes notice. He takes notice what we're doing when we lift our hands up before the Lord, uh, signifying that we adore him, we, we love him, we worship him, he's our God, and so forth. And in the, uh, in the Hebrew culture, in the tabernacle of Moses, and later on in the tabernacle of Solomon, uh, they would always have a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. Morning sacrifice would be about 9 o'clock in the morning, and they would uh, be, be a, a, a sacrifice, and then there would be a, an evening sacrifice as well in the middle of the afternoon. And David would write this song when he, he couldn't be in the temple, because they couldn't have these sacrifices unless there was a temple. And so David was not allowed. He, he might have been running from Saul at that time. And he wrote the psalm and said, I will lift up my hands before the Lord and let it be as the incense of the evening sacrifice. Evening sacrifice was a time of worship, time of communi communicating with God, a time of coming together with him. They'd do it and start off the day worshiping, but they'd also finish the day worshiping. So worship can be, is an open door to have God's blessing coming into our lives to have his influence coming into our lives. Just the same way as we open the door sometimes throughout our lives to the work of the enemy, we can open the door to the Holy Spirit as well, to do things in our lives that uh, probably haven't done <coughs> up to this point. Or he might bring uh, release to us revelation concerning who we are in Christ. All those things are, are relevant. You see, sometimes when we, we come together and we meet with the Lord, sometimes we think that the Lord has to speak in an audible voice in some way in order for him to influence us. But when we come together to worship the Lord and we sense his presence, when he comes and he moves upon us, he is speaking to us. He's speaking to our spirit, our born-again spirit. The, the, the part of us that is actually born again and connected with him, he's speaking in and through us, and he's changing us. You're, not, you're never being in the Lord's presence without being changed. I mean, when we, when we come into his presence, he changes us and causes us to become more sensitive then to his spirit, even when we're out in the workplace. Worship is an open door, or opens the door to... Uh, his, his touching our spirits, our spirit, soul, and body, so that Jesus could be exalted in their lives. Hopefully, we want to see Jesus exalted in their lives, uh, see Jesus glorified in their lives. Then, if that's going to be the case, then we're going to have to be connected with him some way, shape, or form. And not just on Sunday morning, not just when we come to worship the Lord on Sunday morning, but when we come together uh, to worship it with that corporate anointing, it we have a greater chance to be influenced by his spirit so that when we go out there, the residue of what we have received as we worship God together here can be still upon us. And we can uh, increase that. We can, uh, that can be, become greater or lesser depending on how we live. So worship is, a, is an open door. Let's look at another one. Uh, humility is a key to open door. In James chapter 4, verse 6, we read, but he gives more grace, more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility opens the door to receive grace in time of need. Therefore, verse 7, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Humility, walking in humility is key to having Holy Spirit move upon us in order to be able to uh, promote us. Let me put it that way. Humility is, is key when it comes to promotion in the kingdom of God. In this world that we live in, a lot of times people, you know, especially if we see it in politicians all the time, they're promoting themselves all the time. They're pushing uh, their ideas and all the things that they think is right and so forth. But the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, submit to God. And he will promote us. He, he will exalt us. 
Not just the opposite to what the world thinks. Uh, in the, uh, I've, heard, I've heard this said before that a person who is uh, in, in ministry, a person who is promoting themselves leaves themselves open to a lot of influence from the enemy because it ha it's not God that supports, that promotes them. It is them promoting themselves. And when we push ourselves forward, then we're opening the door to the wrong spirit. But submit to God, resist the devil, and God will exalt you. God will promote you. Uh, Hudson Taylor, who started the China Inland Mission and, and just absolutely done wonderful things in China, uh, bringing forth many, many missionaries and many, many people got saved through it and so forth. And there's a story told about two women in Shanghai who were discussing the topic of pride. And they began to wonder if Hudson Taylor was ever tempted to be prideful because of his many accomplishments. One of the women decided to ask Hudson Taylor's wife, Maria, about it. Maria promised the women, women that she would find out. When Mrs. Taylor asked her husband if he had ever been tempted to be proud, he was surprised. Proud? Proud of what, he said. About all the things that you have done, his wife explained. Taylor responded, I never knew I had done anything. Well, he obviously wasn't looking at his accomplishments. He obviously wasn't, all he, all he was doing was serving God. And he was realizing that anything that he's ever done, it came from God. It was actually God that did it through him. It's actually God that, uh, that moved through him. He was a, like a conduit of what God wanted to do. And he's seen himself nothing but a conduit. Uh, conduits are important, but they're not the real thing. You know, there's, there's uh, all kinds of gas lines that there's a big gas running through great huge pipes and these con but all they all they are is just they're holding what's important they're holding the treasure and you and i as we walk here as believers upon this planet and we are anointed of god all we are is people who are holding the treasure that resides on the inside of us and god wants to get that treasure on the inside of us out we're nothing outside god hallelujah but we can accomplish great things because of what flows through us, because of the anointing of God, because of the Spirit of God. We can never take credit. It is God in us who wills to do his good pleasure. Glory to God. And if we'll remember that, it'll keep us out of this arena of pride. Because, man, we open the door to the pride, then, then we have a, a wide open door for the enemy to come in. After all, that's what get, got him kicked out of heaven, wasn't it? He said, I, God, the enemy said, I will exalt myself above the clouds. I will be like the most high. He was boastful, boastful. He was proud. And that's what get, kicked him out of heaven. And if we uh, walk in uh, with a pride spirit, then we'll lose our inheritance as well. We'll lose some of the things that God has for us. He can't promote a, pr a proud spirit. Why? Because he'll just make a mess. So walking in humility is key. During the Civil War, someone reported to Abraham Lincoln that Edwin Stanton, one of the president's cabinet ministers, had referred to him as a fool because of, of uh, an order that Abraham Lincoln had given. And Mr. Lincoln replied, well, I must check into that, for I have found that he usually is correct in his judgments. And the story goes on to say, actually, that Abraham revisited what he was uh, going to do, the order that he had given, and he realized he was wrong. He wasn't too proud to admit that he couldn't be, suggest that he couldn't be corrected. One of the things that will, will is a real antidote for walking in a proud spirit is to be a servant to all is to be willing to be a servant, willing to be a person who is wanting to serve other people. A man told me a story recently about a situation in a church, and he was, he was doing a, a message on servanthood and ser servant leadership. And one of the elders of the church stood up and said, well, I'll tell you one thing, I'm not going to be a servant to anybody. That's, that's good leadership material now, isn't it? 
No, that's, a, that's a, an, an attitude where the enemy can get a hold of in order to hold us in bondage and keep us back from all the good things that the Lord has for us. So walking in humility is a, is a major one. Philippians 4.4 4 says to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. That's an area that will open the door to the blessing of God. If we are people who are rejoicing always, never complaining, if we just realize that every time we complain, we're actually complaining against God. Uh, you know, if the, well, it's a, it's a rainy, cold day. What a miserable day. Well, we're, we're complaining and we're, we're murmuring. And if we, if we were to follow the children of Israel through the land, of, through the wilderness, we would find out that that was one thing that really seemed to annoy the Lord, that they were murmuring about the, you know, if it wasn't, have, uh, uh, wasn't the fact that they had enough meat and he brought the meat and then they gorged themselves in it, it seems like they were a hard bunch to please. And they were just complaining about all the time. Well, sometimes, you know, we, we have to check ourselves if we're complaining. It doesn't matter what situation we're in. I'm sure we can find something good to, come, to uh, talk about, something good to say, something good to thank God for, and leave the complaining to others because there's lots of people who take care of that. We don't have to worry about not, being, have, not having complaints come forward. Luke 11:13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's one area that will open the door of blessing is to ask for the Holy Spirit. Ask the Father to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Never neglect the continuing desire to be filled with the Spirit of God. Not just one time, but every day. Ask the Lord to fill you with the Spirit. Ask the Lord to make you so sensitive to uh, the Holy Spirit that he can't help but coming into your life and doing things for you in that, that particular day. Ask the Lord to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, notice it does say, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? In other words, you've got to do more than just show up. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. You ask the Father to fill you with his Holy Spirit. And if, if you'll do that, he'll respond. Now, just think about this. If your children were in need of something, your children were in need of clothing or need of bread or so forth, and they ask you, and, uh, you know, they got up in the morning and they never, they, they never ate since the supper time before and said, Mom, Dad, I'm hungry. Well, you'd give them something to eat, would you? I mean, if you, were, if you were sitting at the table and about to eat your breakfast and that's all you had, you'd still give your child something to eat. Well, the father is saying, if you'll do that, how much more? Will I give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now, there's, oh, there's different ways of asking. We ask through worship. We ask through uh, reading his word. We ask through prayer. There's all kinds of ways to ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of demonstrations that we show the Father that we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so there might be a, might be a number of things. One of the ways is that when he speaks to us, that we obey his, his word. We obey his thoughts. That opens the door to the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18 says, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living and reckless actions, but be filled with the Spirit. So we have this command to be filled with the Spirit. In the Message Bible, it says, Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God. Huge drafts of Him. And how do you do that? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you might say, well, Father, uh, well, well, Father, <laughs> thought it was a priest there for a minute. <laughs> well, you might say, well, Pastor, how, how am I going to maintain a spirit-filled life? It says right here, speaking to one another in psalms or speaking to yourself. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things to God the Father. That's one of the ways we stay filled with the Spirit of God. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we're not going to, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be able to blame God because we haven't been filled with the Spirit, because we're not living a spirit-filled life, because God is going to say, I told you what to do. 
I give you some clear instruction on what to do to remain filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Then I told you how to do it. Two, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Well, a lot of times some of us have to do that to ourselves because it wouldn't bring a merry heart to other people if they hurt us. So we have to do it to ourselves. And also giving of thanks. Giving of thanks always to the Father. So be filled with the Spirit. Now, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, Holy Spirit came and moved upon the body of uh, the people, uh, 120 people who were in the upper room, and he began to move upon them, and there were some great manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He moved through them. The Bible says that they spoke in other tongues, and, and that the other people looked at them as if they were drunk. So obviously, the, there must have been staggering around and so forth, because if you heard somebody speak in another language, you wouldn't think that he was drunk. You'd think that he knows another language. But in the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues. And then some of the people mocked. Over in Acts chapter 2, verse 13, it says, Others mocking said, They are full of new wine. Now, they were mocking at what they were seeing the Holy Spirit doing in their lives. These people were mocking. Now, it's interesting because uh, it seemed like the, whole, the people went on and they continued to uh, speak in other tongues, they began to continue. The Bible says to praise God in other tongues, and the, and the foreigners heard them speaking in their own language. So they were connected in, in that way. And so here the, the people who were doing the speaking, they were being mocked, and it seemed like they just kept on doing it. It seemed like they weren't ashamed at all. They weren't offended at all. They just kept on praising God. And that's one of the things that you and I are going to have to learn because God is going to lead us to do some things in the days ahead where the Holy Spirit is going to be demonstrating himself through us, and we might be mocked for it, and we're going to have to be, make sure that we're careful not to be offended at it. We just continue to yield to the Holy Spirit, continue to do whatever he says, Continue to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter if people think you're crazy. Man, b before I was saved, I thought Debbie's parents were crazy. They were in church three times a week. I thought, that's nuts. I couldn't understand that at all. But thank God they were. They were praying for me to get saved. <laughs> and so we, we need to uh, continue to be able to move in whatever, whatever way the Holy Spirit tells us to. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. Listen, the enemy will try to shut down anything that God is doing in your life. He will try to kill it. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11, uh, Lazarus came forth, and then over in John chapter 13, the Pharisees, the leaders of the day, the Jews, the people who are against Jesus, they wanted to kill not only Jesus, but Lazarus as well. Because of him, many people were believing in Jesus. These same people, people who were looking at Jesus, wanting to shut him down, decided that they were going to have to take Lazarus out as well. Now, they were being moved upon by the devil. And whatever Jesus brings to your life, the devil will try to kill. He'll try to snuff it out. He'll try to bring it out. And so when you have a great revelation, if the Lord leaves you to a, a revelation of whatever that might be, even living before God in, a, in a, an honorable way, the enemy will try to rob th that from you, to try to keep that from you. He'll try to do everything. He'll present things in front of you to get you to give up on that thing, to give up on the devotions that God has led you to do, to give up on, on serving in, in the church service in, in some way, shape, or form. To give up on doing that specific thing that God has called you to do. You see, Jesus is trying to bring things to life in your life, and the enemy is trying to bring it to death. We have to choose which one we're going to follow. So make sure that we're not confused. Now let's read in Isaiah 58, verse 6. The prophet declaring, by the, declaring the word of the Lord. Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? 
Is it not to share your food with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light will shine, break forth like the morning. Your healing shall bring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, don't put yokes on other people, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. In other words, don't be pointing the finger at somebody else that they're doing some things that are wrong. They're not living up the, the way they should be. We always have to remember when we're pointing the finger at somebody else, there's at least three, three pointing back at you. The prophet says, stop pointing the finger and speaking wickedness. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and, strength, and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Praise the Lord. Well, if we want to know how to open the door of blessing, prosperity into our lives, read Psalm 58, 6 and do as much as you can to follow it. Psalm 58 opens the door to the blessing of God. Now, another one I'm going to, I'm going to mention is one that's called discernment. One of the things that I believe is lacking in the body of Christ, probably more than anything else, is a spirit of discernment, being able to discern between right and wrong. Uh, there are so many things in gray areas. The culture has, has moved in such a way that as God is looking at so many things uh, where it used to be black and white, now, white, now it's gray. Well, th we need discernment to be able to know what is right and what is wrong. And the book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 5.12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the or oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, if we are just babes, we are not skilled in the word of righteousness. When we grow into maturity, we become skilled in the word of righteousness. And what does it mean? What is the word of righteousness? Well, one of the things that I would certainly feel falls in that category is understanding that we are righteous individuals before God, that Jesus Christ has made us righteous, that we are no longer sinners. We've been transformed from sinner to saint. Now, <laughs> this past week, I was listening to the... Uh, Christian radio station, and somebody was selling a book on there, and, and the book, it was obviously a, a minister, was selling a book called How, uh, How to Teach Sinners to Love Like Saints. And I thought, that's the stupidest title I ever heard of. You can't teach a sinner to love like a saint. That's like taking a, a donkey and trying to make it into a pure red racehorse it just can't be done. A sinner can never love like a saint. You need to be a saint to love like a saint. You need to be a saint in order to be righteous. And that's part of understanding the word of righteousness, that we have right standing before God. Because if we go around thinking that we are just sinners in this world, just barely trying to make it to heaven, you know, if we, if we can hang out long enough, we'll make it. Well, if that's the attitude that we have, that opens the door for all kinds of doubt of our worthiness. Do we have an, ever have any, any worth to even to be able to come before God and ask him anything if we're nothing but sinners? No, God says to come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in time of need. That's because we have right standing with God. We can come before God, and it's not our own righteousness. The Bible says that he has given us, Jesus has given us the gift of righteousness. He has made us righteous. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm so thrilled that he's made us righteous. I'm so glad that we don't have to bow down to the enemy. If we weren't righteous, if we were just sinners, then we would be helpless in defeating the enemy. But we have right standing with God. 
And as we understand our right standing with God, that opens the door for blessing in our lives. That opens the door for prosperity in our lives. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. So let's, uh, let's get into the word to understand our, our righteous place. Listen to this in Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written down for, before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Now notice it says those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his word. Meditating on the word of God will open the door for blessing to come into our lives. Will open the door for the Holy Spirit to manifest himself. Because many times when we're in a difficult situation, Holy Spirit will bring to our mind the word of God will bring to our remembrance the word of God, the word that we have read, the word that we have heard, the word that we have meditated on. He will bring to our mind. Remember Jesus said in John 14 that the Holy Spirit would come and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Well, uh, we have to, he's not, he can't bring it to our remembrance if we haven't read it, if we haven't heard it, if we haven't meditated on it. But he will bring to our remembrance, and that can be the very answer that we need at any given time. The Word of God is full of the answers that we need on a daily basis. Those who fear the Lord and meditate on His Word. Psalm 1611, You shall show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is fullness of joy. Well, one of the things that a door that we want to keep open is to be in his presence continually. In other words, don't be caught up with all the things that our flesh enjoys. Be caught up with the presence of Jesus. And the more sensitive we are to the presence of Jesus, the more he will make himself known to us. And the more joy will fill our lives. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Say that with me. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. I read something this week about a man who had died, and uh, he, uh, he had a glorious experience. And it was so glorious that when the doctor resuscitated him, <laughs> and he was so mad when he came back, he sued the doctor. I don't know if that falls into a good category of what a Christian should do, but he was so upset because he, he didn't want to come back to this place. It was so glorious. It was so glorious that he decided he was going to sue the doctor. Hopefully he never followed through with it. But it just shows that that's a glorious place. It is an absolute wonderful place. Hallelujah. Yeah, be ready to meet. Be ready to get there. Well, here's another one. 1 Peter 1, 8. Whom having not seen you love, though now you see, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Well, if we don't see him, then how do we, ex how do we have this joy inexpressible and full of glory? How do, we, how do we do that? Well, we have to do that by faith. We have to think about what's coming. We have to think about our future. We have to think about what we know about heaven. We have to think about all the, re the reports that we have. Jesus, uh, pardon me, the Apostle Paul said, set your mind on things above, set your mind on heavenly things, and not on things of the earth. Well, if we set our mind on heavenly things, we think about what heaven is like, God will give us little glimpses of heaven. And when we get these little glimpses of heaven, we'll have joy inexpressible and full of glory. Have you got that video uh, ready to share there, Amara? Uh, this might be an example of a, uh, expressible, f inexpressible, full of glory. <laughs> Nylander back the other way. He's got Matthews with him. He's got the pass. Goals! <laughs> That's what I would call inexpressible and full of glory. <laughs> they were so, he was so happy, so excited. I thank God that we can be a people living down here 
where we can be full of the glory of the Lord, that the joy of the Lord can fill us at every, any given moment. His joy upon, upon us can rest upon us even uh, in the midst of difficult and trial. Bible says, uh, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And Psalm 51, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Yet the psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and then I will teach transgressor your, transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. You see, it takes the joy of our salvation, the joy of the Lord, to be able to reach out and bring sinners into the kingdom of God. Because if we go around with a long face all the time, who's going to want to join us? But if there's an inexpressible joy upon our, our lives, then people out there are going to wonder what we have to make us so happy even in the middle of a pandemic or in the middle of COVID, in the middle of, middle of things that, they're, that causes them to be afraid of death. They say, how can you be so happy in the midst of all this? Well, I have a home in heaven. I know where I'm going. I thank God for the place that I'm going. And that when I start thinking about the fact that he saved me, he brought me out of a, off the road to hell and put me on the road to heaven, I have every reason to be joyful. And that should be expressed in our faces. Rather than to be a sourpuss all the time. You know, when we, when we get into places of, of worship and we worship the Lord and we give him thanks and praise and when we, when, we, uh, when we come in his presence, there's no place you'd rather be. I want to say to you, you know, some people have a difficult, more difficult time to enter into that than others. But I want to say to you this morning, if you've never experienced the presence of the Lord in worship, if you've never experienced him coming to you in such a way that you think, all of a sudden you think, there's no place I'd rather be right now than right here, right now. There's no place in this world that I'd want to be right now because of your presence that's in me. If you have a difficult time going through, I want to encourage you. You can experience that. You really can experience the joy of the Lord. You, you can experience what he has for you. You can experience the things that God has for you in this season.